At low tide, this is what the Comox estuary looks like today, but for centuries, these tidal flats looked very different. Here, hundreds of fish traps were built to catch salmon and herring. The frame of each trap was built by securely pounding long poles, mostly Douglas fir saplings, into the tidal flats. Woven panels were lashed to the poles and removed when the traps were not in use. When the tide was in, fish would encounter the long lead, which would direct them into the trap. Once inside, they'd be unable to find the exit. As the tide receded, the fish would instinctually seek deeper water, ensuring that they remained in the trap. And once the tide had gone out, fishers could then walk inside and gather up the beached fish, enough to feed the entire community. The heart-shaped traps are older and were used to catch herring, while the newer chevron-shaped traps were designed to catch salmon. Some of the oldest traps were used for over a thousand years. Today, the remains of around 200,000 stakes can be seen across the tidal flats when the tide is out. They provide us with a glimpse of a remarkable, sustainable industry that functioned and fed the community for generations. My grandmother had told me that um, she said at one time, she said that you could walk on, across on the backs of the fish. That's how many fish there used to be. The students are here today to learn about a large intertidal fish trap site that were used by, more recently by the Comox First Nation and the Pentledge people before that. The leads would come off the beach and the traps would be further out in the deeper water. So as the fish traveled along the shoreline, which is part of their natural behavior, they would come in and hit the lead and travel towards deeper water, being their natural reaction, which would put them into the, into the traps along the leads. We're going to actually walk out and look at some of the stakes that were there and we're going to put flags in the stakes so the kids can actually see what the fish traps look like. They're just getting a sense of how extensive this system, this fishery system was. It was such an industry I think that our people used it not only for sustenance for the village and the surrounding areas but also for trade. I know the Comox people would trade with Cowichan and some places over in the mainland and stuff and they would, they would actually ferry large canoes full of fish. The chevron shaped trap targeted salmon and the large heart shaped trap targeted large schooling species such as herring and others. It's all based on fish behavior. They were very complex traps. It does show how uh, knowledgeable the people were back then and, and how precise they were with making things. You can look at sustainability, resource management, you can look at biology, oceanography, history, colonization, treaty negotiations, huge inquiries that could happen after this. It's important for the world to understand that fishing practices of a thousand years ago were as, as sophisticated, if not more sophisticated, than the type of uh, fisheries practices we have today. I know when I was younger there was a big problem of people just coming and going, oh look a stick, and they'd kick it over, not understanding what it was. So I think the more people know, the more respect that will be given to the area and the importance of it. It also reminds us that there were people here before us, and it reminds us of the people that totally relied on their environment. I think that students can learn about bigger concepts and bigger understandings when they know what is happening in their own local place and get a real sense of place and that history is here too. You don't have to look in history books or imagine what was happening in Europe at this time. You can imagine what was happening here in, in Canada. They get a sense of their own community and, and can make connections to people in the past.